Welcome to Stonebridge Online. Just before we start the service, here are some announcements and things to know. During this time of worshiping online, it's important to continue contributing to the ongoing ministry of Stonebridge. Here are the ways in which you can give. You can give online through our website at stonebridgecme.com, click on online giving. You can give through your bank's bill pay option, or you can give by mail. If you'd like business reply offering envelopes sent to you, please contact the church office. The first weekend in October celebrates our unity in Christ with believers around the world and is known as World Communion Sunday. As part of World Communion Sunday, we take the peace and global witness offering as we work to share the peace of Christ beyond our doors, into our community, and around the world. 25% of the offering supports peacemaking within our own community. 25% of this offering will support peacemaking work in our region, and 50% of this offering supports peace and reconciliation work being done by our denomination around the globe. To give to this offering, please make a special note designating Global Peace on your check, envelope, or when you give online. Stonebridge is partnering with Vitalin, formerly known as United Blood Services, for a blood drive this coming Wednesday, October 7th, 9 a.m. to 2 p.m. There is a real need right now for blood donations, and you can be a part of the solution. To make an appointment, please call the number or visit the website on the screen. The Pastor Nominating Committee is excited to announce their final candidate, Pastor John Sauer, and today he will be giving his candidating sermon. Then on Sunday, October 4th at 11 a.m., we'll have a congregational meeting on Zoom to officially extend the call to Pastor John as our next Senior Pastor Head of Staff and approve his terms of call. If you still need to register for the congregational meeting, please visit our website or check the weekly newsletter for the link to register. A helpful tool to use during worship is Uversion. To use this, download the Bible app from your app store. Once downloaded, look for events after clicking more and then click on Stonebridge's live event. This will allow you to use your smart devices while watching the service for online message notes, extra study links, connecting and sending in prayers or praises. We would love to know that you're participating in worship. Continue to share your news, prayers, and praises by emailing prayers at stonebridgecme.com. Or if you are following along in version, please take the time to fill out the e-connection card. You are an important part of Stonebridge's community of faith. Once again, welcome to worship. Hello, Stonebridge. Today, we begin our service with prayer for the President and First Lady of the United States of America, both of whom have tested positive for COVID. Would you pray with me? Gracious Heavenly Father, we thank you for this nation that we live in and that we love. And we pray for the President of the United States and for the First Lady, for Donald Trump and Melania Trump, you are a God of healing and wholeness. And we ask that you would do all that you can, that you would do the best that you can for these two individuals. All of us who are praying have different thoughts, different hopes, different expectations, different fears. And yet all of us together, as the body of Christ, pray for this leader of our nation. We pray for the other 7 million plus people who have COVID. And we pray for the families of more than 200,000 who have died. And we pray that you would do all that you can through us as believers, through the nation's scientists, doctors, through all of us who can do our part. But first and foremost today, our hearts, our prayers, pour out prayers of hope and confidence for the President and First Lady. Be with them and their families, all those who have been in contact with them, 
our minds spiral out of imagination as, as we think of who they've been in contact with over the last days and where those people now are in the nation. Lord, we just pray for your protection over this country. In Jesus' name, amen. Well, Stonebridge, it's a challenging day for our nation. And it's an exciting day for our church. I want to open this worship service with a scripture from Deuteronomy chapter 7. And it's appropriate for what's going on in our country and in our church this weekend. It says this, Know therefore that the Lord your God is God. The faithful God who maintains covenant loyalty with those who love him and keep his commandments to a thousand generations. Stonebridge, that's us. That's you. We have the opportunity today to hear from our candidate for our new senior pastor and to have a congregational meeting this weekend where we can call him into that role and that position. It's exciting. And God is faithful. He's faithful to this country and he's faithful to his people for a thousand generations. That's us. That's you. That's Stonebridge, and it's witness here in Simi Valley. So come, let us worship together in confidence, in hope, in spirit, and in truth.
Hello, Stonebridge. I'm Pastor John, and I wish I could be there with you all in person. However, as I'm sure you know, we are in a worldwide pandemic, which makes traveling a little difficult. Um, it also makes gathering a little difficult. But I look forward to interacting with you all through the congregational meeting through Zoom this weekend. And I look forward to, hopefully, if you affirm this call, being with you all and getting to know you over these next number of years. This morning, we are going to continue the series that Pastor Neil has been doing on the Gospel of Mark. And we'll be looking at Mark chapter 10. And our scripture this morning comes from Mark chapter 10. It is Mark 10, 35 through 40. And Jesus is with his disciples walking along the road. And as they are walking, Jesus is telling them a little bit about what he will do as the Messiah. And then Jesus is disciples, two of them, James and John, approach him. And that's where our story is this morning. So, hear the word of God as I read the scripture. Mark 10, 35 through 40. James and John, the sons of Zebedee, came forward to him and said to him, Teacher, we want you to do for us whatever we ask of you. And he said to them, What is it you want me to do for you? And they said to him, Grant us to sit, one at your right hand and one at your left, in your glory. But Jesus said to them, You do not know what you are asking. Are you able to drink the cup that I drink or be baptized with the baptism that I am baptized with? They replied, We are able. Then Jesus said to them, The cup that I drink you will drink, and with the baptism with which I am baptized you will be baptized. But to sit at my right hand or at my left is not mine to grant but it is for those for whom it has been prepared. This is the word of God, and thanks be to God. I invite you to join with me in prayer. Lord, as we come before your scriptures, we ask that you would speak clearly to each of us. Illuminate your scriptures, Lord. Bring light to them so that we can hear your word clearly, so we can see you at work. We can know who you are. Take the words of my mouth and speak to each one of us, Lord, so that we hear your word. We thank you, and it's in the name of the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit we pray. Amen. What is it that you would like me to do for you? That's the question that Jesus responds to James and John with. What is it you would like me to do for you? How can I help you? What do you want? What can I do for you? That's what Jesus responds to them with when they come to him with this request. And I think for many of us, we can think of a time in our lives where we wish that Jesus were standing in front of us asking that same question. What is it you want me to do for you? That question, Jesus actually asks it twice in Mark chapter 10. This time we have in front of us is just the first time that Jesus asks that question. But as the chapter goes on, he asks it again. This time, though, we have Jesus speaking with James and John. And James and John are two of the 12 disciples. They're known as the 12. The 12 are this rather elite group of disciples that Jesus calls by name to himself to be his followers, to live life with him, and then later on to be dynamic leaders in the church. So James and John, they're two of the 12. The thing with the 12 that you have to know, though, especially in the Gospel of Mark, the 12 don't really get it. Throughout the Gospel, at any given point, they don't seem to understand who Jesus is. They don't understand what he's doing, what his mission is. They, they really just don't get what Jesus' purpose is. So, Mark portrays them as just asking silly questions, not grasping what is actually happening right in front of them. Some scholars even develop theories trying to figure out why does Mark hate the 12? I don't think Mark hates the 12, but any reading of Mark will show you the 12 don't really get it. In Mark chapter 8, Jesus tells the 12 that he is going to be betrayed, he's going to be tortured, he's going to go to the cross, he's going to die, and then he'll be resurrected. 
And the response from the 12 is that Peter tries to take Jesus aside and correct him and rebuke him and tell him he's wrong. It results in that famous line from Jesus to Peter saying, get behind me, Satan. A chapter later in Mark chapter 9, for a second time, Jesus tries to tell the 12 what his purpose is, what he came for. Jesus tells them that he will be betrayed, he will be tortured, he will go to the cross, he will die, and then he'll be resurrected. And what's the response of the 12 this time? They begin arguing and debating about which of them is the greatest. Jesus talks about his own suffering, and instead of understanding what is laying ahead for them also and what lays ahead for all followers of Jesus, they argue about who the greatest is. They don't get it. And then, a third time, Jesus tells the 12 that he is going to be betrayed, he is going to be tortured, he is going to go to the cross, he's going to die, and then be resurrected. And what's the response this time? It's James and John. It's what we have here in Mark 10, 35 through 40. They approach Jesus, and they t- ask if they can sit at his right and his left in glory. They don't get it. They're still just wrapped up in these ideas of power, these ideas of of glory. So in this dialogue, James and John walk up to Jesus and say, we want you to do whatever we want you to do for us. If that strikes you as a little arrogant, it's because it's very arrogant. They're putting Jesus in the position of serving them. They're trying to tell Jesus what to do. Jesus is the master. Jesus is the teacher. They're the students. They're the disciples, but they're reversing that and trying to assert a level of power over Jesus here. It's very arrogant. Jesus, though, in his graciousness, responds by asking them this question that I began the sermon with. What is it that you want me to do for you? What would you like me to do for you? What what are you desiring? Now, if Jesus at this point had any concerns about them being arrogant or them not understanding the whole point of his ministry, those concerns become solidified with what they say next. Because they say that what they want, what they want their master Jesus to do is to guarantee that they sit in these positions of power when he comes in his glory. They're angling to get the best spot. They're angling to get the the power, the glory, the honor. They don't get it. Jesus reaffirms that they don't understand it when he says, are you willing to drink the cup that I drink, to be baptized in the baptism in which I am baptized? Now, to translate that for you all, Jesus is talking about his suffering. He's going to suffer. He's told them that three times now. And this is another way of him asking, are you willing to suffer? Remember the cup that Jesus is talking about in the Garden of Gethsemane? Before he's about to be crucified, he'll say, Father, let this cup pass from me. That's the cup that he's talking about. James and John, they don't really think. They don't miss a beat. They just say, yes, we are able. And at this point, we all have to acknowledge that James and John are probably the worst negotiators in the entire Bible. They come to Jesus asking really for a blank check, and Jesus says, you get nothing except suffering. You can almost see Jesus there as Willy Wonka saying, you get nothing. They did a terrible job negotiating this. All they are going to walk away with is suffering, not the seats of power and glory that they asked Jesus for. But they just don't get it. They don't understand it. We could look at James and John, we can vilify them, we can look at the 12 and their lack of understanding, and we could try to shame them. But I think actually the fact that they don't get it, for me at least, is pretty comforting. We're taught so often to seek power over our own lives, to seek control, to seek our own security. We have so many messages coming in telling us that that really is the goal of life. to to make ourselves. And right now, we're in the middle of a presidential election that is completely focused on power. 
And not just a presidential election, but every two years we have senatorial and House elections throughout our country that are all about power and people wanting power, people grabbing power. It's easy for us to think that that's what our lives are for. It's easy for us to not get it also. We can't just blame the 12 for not understanding. We are right there with them. And the reason that that's comforting to me is that even though they don't get it, Jesus still pursues them. Notice in this story that Jesus tells them that they're gonna get suffering and that's about it, but he doesn't break off relationship. He doesn't shame them. He continues to walk with them through life. He continues to make room for them and invite them into his ministry. And later on, James and John, they will become leaders in the church. They'll fulfill the mission that, Peter, that, that Jesus has given to them. That's what Jesus does with all the 12. So if they don't get it and Jesus accepts them, when we don't get it, we can know Jesus still accepts us. Jesus still embraces us. That us not understanding what Jesus is all about, it really just blinds us to who Jesus is. It blinds us to seeing the ways in which God works in the world. So I think that that's, that's a comfort. But there's another comfort in this text as well. As I said at the beginning of the sermon, this is really the first time that Jesus asks this question, what is it you'd like me to do for you? And if you continue on in the Gospel of Mark chapter 10, you'll come very quickly to the second time that Jesus asks this question. It's a story that happens right after Jesus corrects his disciples, right after he tells them that their lives aren't to be meant focused on power, but their lives are to be meant sacrificing and suffering and pursuing the cross. It's a story of a man named Blind Bartimaeus. Now next week, Pastor Neil is also gonna preach on Bartimaeus. He's gonna take it from a different angle because there's so much in this story to look at. But Bartimaeus, he's blind and he's a beggar and he sits out in front of the city walls. He's outside of the city and he's there begging. Now, if you were blind in Bartimaeus' day, you weren't just blind. You were viewed as being born in sin, as being cursed. You were separated from society. Nobody really helped you. That's why Bartimaeus is out there begging. It's not just the physical disability. It, it's all the social stigma that comes along with it. But Bartimaeus hears that Jesus of Nazareth is coming. And what does Bartimaeus do? He starts screaming, Jesus, son of David, have mercy on me. Now notice right there the contrast already between Bartimaeus and James and John. James and John, what was their request? It was for power, it was for glory, it was to sit in these positions of power. What's Bartimaeus' request? It's mercy. James and John come to Jesus saying, give us a blank check. Bartimaeus just comes begging for mercy. Right away we see the differences. And Jesus responds to Bartimaeus with the same question, almost word for word, that he asked James and John. What is it you'd like me to do for you? That question is so important, and it can't be an accident that Mark, the writer of this gospel, has placed these two stories right by each other with the same exact question asked to two different people. Because Mark is drawing this contrast, helping us to understand that if James and John are the way we're not to respond, Bartimaeus is the way we are to respond. So what is Bartimaeus' response? He asks Jesus to restore his sight. Now, looking at it on the surface here, it could seem that it's just a self-interested thing that Bartimaeus is asking for, but I think there's something deeper going on here. Throughout the Gospel of Mark, Jesus healing blind people, healing ailments. It's not just about their ailments. It's not just about the demons that Jesus casts out. It's not just about whatever diseases he cures. It's about the restoration of the world through the kingdom of God breaking into this world. So Bartimaeus asking for his sight, it's more than just him experiencing his sight. It's Bartimaeus asking for restoration. He wants his body to function in the way God intended. 
He wants the world to look how it's supposed to look. He doesn't want any extravagant power or glory or honor. Bartimaeus simply wants things to line up with God's hopes for the world, for his body. He wants restoration. See, if the 12 in James and John, they don't really understand it, someone like Bartimaeus does understand it. He understands what Jesus is there for. I think he gets what Jesus' purpose is. Jesus' purpose is the cross. He's told his disciples that three times now. Maybe it's the fact that Bartimaeus had to beg. Maybe it's the fact that he's coming from a position where there was no power. He had no power in his life. For whatever reason, he gets it. It's more than just blindness. It's restoration. And Jesus' purpose was restoration. But it was restoration through the cross. Jesus came to this world to die on a cross for us. Now, we're used to the symbol of a cross. Many of you, I'm sure, have crosses in your homes, crosses around your necks. We're used to the symbol of a cross. So sometimes I don't think we get how shocking it really is that that's the symbol that Christians use. A cross in Jesus' day, it was not a symbol of power. It was the exact opposite of a symbol of power. The cross in Jesus' day, the one that he's told his disciples he's going to go to, that cup that Jesus is going to drink, that was the ultimate symbol of shame and disgrace. If you were crucified, your very personhood was taken away and you were used as a symbol by the Roman Empire to strike terror into people. A cross was designed to be the most brutal of deaths so that somebody walking into a Roman city along the road would see people crucified along the way and they would be so scared of breaking the law because of what they saw from these crucified people that they would never break a Roman law. Crucifixion was supposed to be all about Rome's power and the people who were crucified, the symbol of the cross, it was one of disgrace and shame. It was the exact opposite of a symbol of power. But that's what Jesus came for. Jesus took the standard power in the world and he turned it upside down. He taught everyone that we're to do the same, that though we don't get it at times, though we're like the 12, we're supposed to be more like Bartimaeus, recognizing our spiritual blindness, recognizing our lack of power, coming to Jesus asking for mercy, experiencing that mercy, and then when Jesus does do a wonder in our lives, following Jesus just like Bartimaeus did. Mark places these two stories together with this question, what is it you want me to do for you on purpose? Now earlier in the sermon I said, I'm sure we can all think back to times where we wish we had Jesus in front of us, asking us that question so that we could answer it also. I'm sure we can all think of moments where we wish that. I think there's an argument here, though, in these stories, the one of James and John and the one of Bartimaeus. There's an argument in this that Jesus actually asks this question a third time. With the way Mark has structured these stories, with that question being the focal point for each story, it's very clear that Mark is saying this is the question that Jesus does ask us right now in this moment. The readers of this story, the people who'd want to follow Jesus later on, this is the third time that Jesus asks this question. Right now, Jesus stands in front of us asking us, what is it that we want Jesus to do? And our response to that is so important for our lives. Jesus is going to accept us regardless of our response because that's God's grace. But in terms of our lives as we move forward following Jesus, if we choose the way of James and John, if we get seduced by power and we start thinking that grabbing power is the point of our lives, we will become blind to all that God is doing in the world. We won't be able to see the wondrous works of God because when you get focused on power, it starts to be the only thing you can see. If like Bartimaeus though, we recognize our spiritual blindness, we throw ourselves at the mercy of God, we don't seek our own power, but we recognize that following Jesus leads to the cross. And when we start focusing on restoration instead of power, on coming alongside God's work of restoring 
the world, restoring our communities, restoring the people that God has given, put in front of us, the people that God has given us to care for. When we adopt that approach, our eyes are open just like Bartimaeus's, and we can see and follow Jesus more closely. So Jesus stands in front of us all right now asking us that question, what is it that you want me to do for you? And is the answer power or mercy? Is the answer glory or restoration? And is the answer honor or the cross? May we answer in the way Bartimaeus did. In the name of the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, amen.
will always be enough. Nothing compares to your embrace. Light of the world, forever rain. I'm running to your arms. I'm running to your arms. The riches of your love will will sing no other name Jesus Jesus my heart will sing no other name Jesus Stonebridge, it has been a pleasure to be able to preach the word with you this morning, and I look forward to interacting with you all in the congregational meeting, and thank you for tuning in to worship and for worshiping our God together. Now, as you go from this place, may you go with eyes to see all that God is doing. May you go pursuing the restoration that God is working in this world, and may you go following Jesus even to the cross. May you go in the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, the fellowship of the Holy Spirit, and love of the Father. In the name of the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, go in peace. Amen. Mm-hmm.